Hello folks, how are you? My name is Matthew Warwick. I am the Education Officer at the Ulster Scots Community Network and I have been asked to speak to you uh, about Scotland's bard, Rabbi Burns, on uh, the 25th of January is celebrated by Scots all over the world as Burns Night or Burns Nacht, where people meet, they eat haggis, neeps and tatties and they sing Rabbi Burns' songs and they read his poetry. So I've got a little online presentation for you and we're going to look at the life and times and the inspiration and the work of Rabbi Burns. So I've got a little PowerPoint here for you. Hopefully you can all see. So it's an introduction to Rabbi Burns, Scotland's Bard. Who was Burns? Well, he was born on a farm and near Alloway, a little village just south of the town of Ayr in Ayrshire, the west coast of Scotland, 25th of January, 1759. He became Scotland's greatest ever poet and a national hero. And this is the, the image that we're used to seeing of Ravi Burns. This was uh, painted by a famous Scottish portrait artist called Alexander Naismith whenever the young Burns was in his first flush of fame in around 1787, after his first uh, book of poetry had been published in 1786, it was very successful. And this, in every image you more or less see of Ravi Burns is taken from this famous portrait. However, he did sit for another portrait during his life, and this was by his friend uh, Alexander Reed. And this was painted in 1796, uh, whenever Burns was 37 years old, and it was, uh, of course, just a few months before he died. And Ravi Burns said about this portrait that it was the best likeness of him he had ever seen. So there's a wee bit of a difference between this ruddy-cheeked, uh, handsome young poet here, between this fella, uh, is maybe the hair's a wee bit thinner, is maybe a wee bit fleshier about the jowls, uh, but I, I like to think of this maybe represents the country uh, bard Burns comfortable in his position uh, as a customs and excise man and poet. So why are we celebrating Robert Burns? And why do people celebrate Burns across the world? Well, a few things that's interesting to note about him. He was born into a humble farming family, not into a palace. So his father... Um, was a tenant farmer. He had been a, a sort of gardener or estate manager uh, a previous occasion. He was originally from Kincardenshire, but ended up in Ayrshire. And he was a tenant farmer. He did not own the land he leased. He uh, rented it from a landlord and he worked very hard to try and sustain his family. And the young Burns spent much of his time on the farm. And indeed, more or less until the last five years of Burns's life, he had this idea that he was a farmer. He wanted to succeed at farming, uh, but that wasn't always the case. He wrote in the Lowland Scots language. Now, uh, Lowland Scots uh, is a separate language from modern English. It has evolved from largely the same medieval uh, origins. So there, the, the words there have influences from uh, Old Norse, the language of the Vikings, also from Anglo-Saxon, uh, from the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes, the people who uh, came into uh, Great Britain after the Romans pulled out in around the 5th, 6th century. Uh, of course, there's influences of Norman French there as well. Uh, and all these things went into a melting pot and came out as Lowland Scots. And, and Burns was very proud of writing poetry in his native tongue. What was the subject matter of his poetry? He wrote about farming, food, politics, religion, and romance. Everyday things that anyone, no matter what strata of society they came from, uh, he was able uh, to provide them with inspiration uh, that they could identify with. Burns, of course, whenever he first published his poetry, uh, he, he, he did have a sort of a nickname, uh, not quite a, a pseudonym, but it was, he's known as the Ayrshire Plowman. And it was a, a little tagline he carried with him with pride uh, throughout his life. And of course, back then there were no tractors. Uh, the the plow would have been pulled by uh, either a team of two or four horse. And it was a time of a bit of a revolution in agriculture in Scotland. Um, 
the the Corran Ironworks, uh, not far from Stirling, uh, were making uh, cast iron farming utensils and uh, allowing a, a bit of a transformation, uh, a revolution in agriculture. And Burns uh, tried his best to make a living from the farming. So why are we celebrating Burns and Ulster? So if we look at this satellite map here, at the closest point, Scotland and Ulster are separated by just over 12 and a half miles of sea between uh, the Mull of Kintyre and Torhead and County Antrim. Uh, but even uh, the, the, the main shipping route uh, today is Belfast or Larne across to Cunryan. And back at the time of Burns, it was uh, largely Port Patrick to Uh So at that point, there's only about 20 miles of the North Channel of the Irish Sea separating Scotland from Ulster. And people had been coming and going between the two places uh, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. But Burns, uh, during his lifetime, the, the plantation of Ulster was nearly 200 years old by that stage. And there were huge numbers of Scots and descendants of Scots living uh, all across the nine counties of Ulster who identified with the Lone Scots language that Rabbi Burns used. Uh, so those people uh, were more or less kin to Burns uh, and Burns's uh, folk from Ayrshire and uh, Dumfries and Galloway and uh, could identify with the words and phrases that he used. Um, in 1796, the year that Burns died, age 37, uh, a, a French royalist uh, emigre called the Chevalier de la Tochnoy I visited Belfast and he kept a journal and in it he said Belfast is almost entirely the look of a Scotch town and the character, character of its inhabitants has considerable resemblance to that of the people of Glasgow. So what's he saying there? When this guy visited Belfast in 1796, he thought he was in an extension of Scotland. So we could see why Burns's poetry was celebrated and lauded and appreciated on this side of the Shach. Belfast was also the first place to publish a book of Burns's poetry outside of Scotland, printed by James McGee, uh, a printer from Bridge Street in Belfast in 1787. And it was a replica or a facsimile copy, if you like, of the, the Edinburgh edition of Burns's poetry. His first poetry was published in 1786 out of Kilmarnock. Burns had uh, saved up some money to print a book of his poems because he was trying to raise funds to emigrate to Jamaica to uh, work on a plantation there as a bookkeeper. Uh, however, he had no cash and his only saleable commodity was his poetry. So some of his friends encouraged him to, to publish uh, this book of poetry. It was, and it was an overnight success. People couldn't get enough of it. And it, it, it gave him a sort of a level of celebrating or a level of what's the word I'm looking for, celebrity and status that he had, uh, had hitherto enjoyed. Uh, he was soon invited to Edinburgh through Masonic connections and um, he was giving speeches and reciting his poetry to the very top people of society, judges, lawyers, ministers, uh, politicians, lairds, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And he realised that there was probably money to be made in being the darling of the Scots poetry world at this time. Uh, however, back to James McGee, James McGee copied the e Edinburgh edition, but such was copyright laws between Scotland and Ireland back then that Robert Burns never saw a penny from the James McGee Belfast edition of 1787. So it was more or less a pirated copy. Uh, McGee was very clever. There was copyright surrounding images and paintings and portraits. So he got a local artist to copy the portrait of Burns that was in the Edinburgh edition. So it then became an original uh, piece of work. Uh, and then he put the, the, the copy, the inferior copy, if you like, in the Belfast edition so it didn't break any laws. And it was hugely popular here in Ulster. Uh, and of course, Burns had a following. Uh, he had sent many of his poems over to the Belfast newsletter. Uh, uh, he, he sent over extracts knowing that there was a readership in Ulster who spoke uh, Scots to a degree, uh, like his, uh, the folk from his, uh, his own country, the Ulster Scots, if you like, and, and they really devoured 
Burns's poetry and there was big demand for it. Burns had a good relationship with Henry Joy, the editor, the proprietor of the Belfast newsletter, uh, one of the world's oldest surviving English newspapers, English speaking newspapers, uh, of course, first uh, established in Belfast in 1737. And Henry Joy actually even went to visit Burns in 1794 and did an interview with him that he published in the paper. Such was the interest in the, the great man himself. During the early 1800s, just after Burns died, books were just not as plentiful as they are now. Uh, of course, they were expensive to produce because they had to be printed in a big old mechanical printing press, like something you would see in the, the Folk and Transport Museum. But because of that, books just maybe weren't as uh, bountiful across the province uh, as they would later become. But it was said that Nine times out of 10, if people had books in their homes, ordinary rank and file, working class people in Ulster, they had a copy of the Bible. And if they had another book at all, it was usually a copy of Burns's poetry. Such was his popularity. Belfast also uh, houses or is home to the Gibson Collection. Uh, a native of Ayrshire called Andrew Gibson ended up working most of his life and living in Belfast. He was a governor of the Linden Hall Library and uh, a member of various charitable societies. He was a huge Burns fan and amassed a, a ginormous collection of what we call Burnsiana. So books, paintings, ornaments, anything at all that would have an image or an association with Ravi Burns, he collected it, thousands and thousands of items. And uh, it was donated to the people of Belfast. And it's now uh, on this, some of it's on display in the Lynn Hall Library. Part of it's stored there and part of it's stored in other places. It's the biggest collection of Burns material outside of Scotland today. And it's definitely well worth a look. So why is Burns celebrated? Well, he was uh, a a genius. He reserved, he received a little bit of education uh, as a child. Uh, he often liked this, this nickname that he had as the heaven inspired Ayrshire plowman poet, but he did receive a good standard of education. His father wanted his sons, uh, Rabbi and his brother Gilbert to receive a good education. His father uh, William Burness, slightly different spelling of the name to what Burns used. Uh, he wanted his children to have a good education so effectively they could read the Bible and interpret it for themselves. Uh, he hired a, a tutor called John Murdoch to teach the young Burns boys uh, the basics of education, so their arithmetic, their literature, their writing. They also received instruction in things like French and a wee bit of Latin. But this guy Murdoch instilled in the young Burns a love of poetry in his native Scots, and he was introduced to the writing of uh, Alan Ramsay, the great Scots language poet, and also uh, the writing of Robert Ferguson, uh, a young Edinburgh uh, poet who died very, very young, but uh, left some fantastic poetry that really struck a chord with the young Ravi Burns, particularly in its use of the, the common tongue of Scotland. Burns uh, wrote his first poem aged around maybe 14 years old uh, and he was in the harvest field. Uh, I think they were probably harvesting oats or something like that and again everything was done by hand and the tradition had been that they would have paired up a young lad with a young lassie. Uh, the idea behind this was that if you let all the young lads work together they would fight and brag and wrestle and get no work done and if you let all the lassies work together, they would gossip and chat and be distracted. So you paired up a young lad up with a young lassie to bring in the harvest. And uh, the young Burns was paired with this slightly older girl called Nell Kilpatrick. And Burns was very taken with her. Uh, and uh, his first poem that he described as he put pen to paper was this. Oh, once I loved a bonnie lass. Oh, once I loved a bonnie lass and I love her still. And whilst that virtue warms my breast, I love my handsome Nell. As bonny lasses I hae seen, and money full as bra, but for a modest grace for me, the like I never saw. A bonny lass, I will confess, is pleasant to the e, but without some better qualities, she's no a lass for me. But Nelly's looks are blithe and sweet, and what is best of all, her reputation is complete and fair without a flaw. She dresses icy, clean and neat, both decent and genteel, 
Then there's something in her gait, gars on a dress look weel. A gory dress and gentle air may slightly touch the hurt, but it's innocence and modesty that polishes the dirt. Tis this and Nelly pleases me, tis this enchants my soul, for absolutely in my breast she reigns with it control. So that's pretty heavy stuff for a young teenage Burns, but it's, it, it shows his command of language and how he could draw inspiration from everyday subjects. So maybe look at some other poems in a wee minute. But one of Burns's great gift to Scots uh, and, and Scots history and Scots literature is that he was a great songwriter, poet, but he was also a collector, a collector and editor of existing work. And one song that he collected uh, fragments of was this Auld Lang Syne. And uh, Burns loved the concept of this. There had been old poems with, with using some of this language and songs, but Burns sort of collected different versions of it and made it his own. He claimed to have collected it from a, an old drunk man singing, but uh, uh, various versions of Auld Lang Syne had appeared in print in Scotland long before the life of Burns. However, he definitely took it, adapted it and made it his own. And now, of course, it's one of the most commonly sang songs in the world every New Year's Eve or Old Year's Nacht, whenever the bells strike 12, people link their hands together and sing Auld Lang Syne. Should Auld Acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Should Auld Acquaintance be forgot and Auld Lang Syne? For Auld Lang Syne, my Joe, for Auld Lang Syne, we'll tack a cup of kindness yet. We'll take a wee drink and toast each other's health for Auld Lang Syne. Auld Lang Syne, uh, translated from Scots, means old long since, or effectively the good old times or good old days. Uh, so it's looking back on your old acquaintances, remembering to remember them, not forgetting them, and uh, remembering all the good times you've had together and, and having a wee drink and toasting their health. Uh, so it's responsible for our Lang Syne, which uh, has universal appeal across the world. Um, it was... Uh, Whenever the, the US Civil War ended, uh, General Grant allegedly ordered that the, the band at the, the, the official Confederate surrender struck up Au Lang Syne because it was a popular song among the men of both uh, armies. And it encapsulated the spirit of let bygones be bygones. Let's, you know, look to the good times. Uh, and and it, it's, it, it has an important place in sort of American history and largely the use of it in New Year's Eve started in New York uh, among sort of bands there. Uh, if you look at cinema, um, we're not that long after Christmas and uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful life, the old Jimmy Stewart classic. It finishes with what? Them all getting together and singing I Lang Syne. So it's even had prominence in popular culture. But Burns is also responsible for making haggis the national dish of Scotland because Burns wrote a love letter to the haggis. Uh, it was something that uh, it, it, it's more or less based on an old Viking recipe. Um, it, it has probably existed uh, historically. The records show that it has existed in England longer than Scots, but it's something the Scots have taken to heart and made their own. Why? Well, because Rabbi Burns sort of revived an interest in haggis. Um, he thought the haggis was delicious, uh, a, a lovely meal, uh, but I think what he liked about it was it was made of all the cheapest cuts of the sheep, sort of the entrails, the leftovers, uh, and mixed with good Scottish oatmeal cooked in a sheep's stomach, the, the, the lungs, the heart, the liver, mixed with onions and maybe some pepper and spices. It made a, a bountiful meal that should be celebrated. And his uh, address to the haggis um, is part of the formal Burns Night proceedings. So here's the first verse of it. Fair for your honest sunsy face, great chieftain of the pudding race, abundant them all, ye pack your place, pinch, tripe, or therm, we lorry you worthy, O a grace, as langs me arm. And it goes on for about another eight or nine verses, saying that if the Scotsman, he doesn't want to eat fricassee or ragu or foreign uh, meals from France, he wants to eat haggis, if he eats haggis, he'll be able to chop off his enemy's uh, legs and arms and heads on the field of battle with his sword, just like he was cutting the tops of thistles in the field. And that the Scots 
if you want the Scots to give a, a grateful prayer of thanks to God, serve them a haggis. And this rousing patriotic love letter to this haggis has made it the national food of Scotland. So what does it mean? Well, fair for you, on a sunset face. Fair for you is a traditional Lowland Scots greeting, sort of hello and good luck to you. So hello and good luck to your honest sunset face. Sunset means ample, round, well filled, because it's a big round dish. Great chieftain of the pudding race, king of all the puddings. Abun the maw, you take your pace. Above the maw, you take your pace. Pinch, tripe or therm. Those were all our meals made up of animal guts, essentially. We are ye worthy of a grace. You're so delicious, you're worthy of a grace. A prayer thanks to God, as long as my arm, as long as my arm. So Burns has even affected food and people's eating habits. Uh, I talked about the Burns Night Supper. Uh, they are held every year on the Bard's birthday, the 25th of January. The first Burns Night Supper was held in 1801, some five years after the, the Bard's death. But it was actually held on the, the, the fifth anniversary of his, of his death rather than his birthday. Uh, and it was held in the Burns Cottage in Alloway, uh, where some of his friends got together to celebrate his life. They ate haggis and I think sheep's head, and they sang his songs and they read his poems. Uh, the next year, 1802, they held another event uh, and they moved it to January to celebrate the Bard's birthday, but they got his birthday wrong and they held it on the 29th of January. And it wasn't until 1803 that the, the Burns supper was held on uh, the 25th of January, uh, Burns's birthday. And the, there was a Greenock uh, Burns Association or whatever. They got together and they made it. They were the first to make it an annual event. And it swept right throughout Scotland and anywhere Scots were in the world. And then also anywhere people had an appreci appreciation of Robbie Burns's poetry. So at the Burns Night Supper, uh, a haggis is usually piped in, uh, received by the bagpipes. Uh, and then the, the uh, a guest speaker recites uh, the address to a haggis. Uh, stabbing it at the appropriate place, cutting it up and everything else. And then after that, uh, they usually say this grace. This is the Selkirk grace. Now, this was a common grace in the loans of Scotland around the time of Burns. He did not invent this, but he performed it or he recited it one night when asked uh, in the company of the Earl of Selkirk, Selkirk uh, a local uh, Scottish aristocrat. And it's very simple. Some hay meat and can I eat, and some would eat that want it. But we hay meat and we can eat and say the Lord be thanked. So some people have food, but they're not able to eat it, maybe through ill health. And some would love to have food, and they want it. So maybe there's people who are poor and have nothing to eat. But we have food, we have meat, we have food, and we have the health to eat it. So thanks be to God. Very, very simple, very, very effective. I said earlier that Burns uh, took inspiration from the very mundane, ordinary things uh, and turned it into his poetry. One such occasion was uh, he wrote this poem called To a Louse. Um, and he was sitting in church. Uh, the story goes he was sitting in church and noticed this pretty young girl with very fancy clothes coming in and sitting a few pews in front of him. And uh, obviously she caught the young Burns's eye. But after a while, he started to notice her itching and scratching and everything else and it turns out that she was uh, infested with head lice um, which some you know would have probably been a lot more common uh, condition than it is now um, but Burns thought this was hilarious that even though this young lady had money and status and all the finery and the trappings of money the head lice still wanted to make uh, their home on her head. So this is this is one of the, the, the last verses of it. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a wee bit from the start. Ha! Where are you gone, you crowl and furly? Your impudence, your impudence protects you surly. I can't say, but you strut rarely. Our gauze and lace, no faith. I fear ye dine, but sparely on such a place. Ye ugly, creeping, blasted wonner, the test that shunned by saint and sinner, how dare you set your foot upon her? Say, fine, a lady. Go somewhere else and seek your dinner on some poor body. Oh, Jenny, Jenny, toss your heed and set your beauties all abreed. You little ken, what cursed speed the blast is making. Thy winks and finger ends, I dread, are notice taken. 
or would some power they gift the gaze to see yourselves as others see us? Uh, would for money a blunder free us and foolish notion what errors in dress and gait would lace and even devotion? So what's Burns saying there? He turns it into a, comment, a, a sort of social commentary, uh, sort of saying that could we be, uh, it doesn't matter who we are, the lice could infest us, rich, poor, all alike. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had the opportunity to see ourselves through somebody else's eyes? Uh, maybe we wouldn't be so pompous. Maybe we wouldn't have such a high opinion of ourselves. It would maybe teach us a little bit of humility. Imagine getting that from somebody with head lice. But that was Burns. He was renowned for his love uh, poetry, uh, his love of the ladies. Uh, Burns was married in his life, maybe an unconventional marriage, to uh, his sweetheart, uh, Jean Armour. Uh, it was an unconventional marriage. They sort of drew up this contract between them. Jean Armour's father wouldn't allow them initially to be married because Burns had a bit of a reputation as a, 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 a cad and a, a bounder and a scoundrel and a bit of a ladies' man. Uh, Burns was heartbroken and that was the time he was going to emigrate to Jamaica. Uh, luckily for Jean that he made the money from the poetry and he stayed and he lived with Jean and he looked after her. However, he did have numerous affairs with various other ladies. Uh, he had somewhere in around 15 children uh, nine with Jean, although many of them died uh, in infancy. Uh, and it's quite sad. And Burns was deeply affected by the death of some of his children, and it put him into sort of uh, bouts of depression through his life. This is probably his most famous love song. It's called My Love is Like a Red, Red Rose. Uh, and Burns was pretty good at using this idea, the symbolism of a, a rose uh, as being uh, a metaphor or symbol for love. Uh, he uses it as well in Ye Banks and Braes of Bonnie Doon. But this is, this is the famous one. My love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. My love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. As fair art thou, my bonnie lass, so deep in love am I. And I will love thee still, my dear, till ah the seas gang dry. Till ah the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. And I will love thee still, my dear, though the sands of life shall run. And fair thee will, my only love, and fair thee will a while. And I will come again, my love, though twere 10,000 miles. Very, very simple, very powerful imagery. Um, you know, Burns could have made an absolute fortune out of writing Valentine's cards uh, and things like that. He was very, very witty. Seemingly, this poem was composed for a, a soldier who was taking leave and leaving a sweetheart, and he wanted something, uh, a, a little memento for her, a token of his love, and, and Burns. Uh, I think jotted these lines down for the price of a few few eels or a few a few wines, a few drinks, and and of course it has survived. Uh, it's lasted the, the the stood the test of time. Uh, and of course we talked about Al Lang Syne earlier. We'll have a look at some of the other um, some of the other verses from it. Uh, now this is something that Scots and Burns enthusiasts get very passionate and very emotive about. Uh, it's Ao Lang Syne, not Ao Lang Syne, like Syne, like a Z, it's Ao Lang Syne, uh, and it's never uh, in the chorus, it's never, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for the sake of Ao Lang Syne, okay, that, that's something that has crept in, uh, in in later times and wasn't part of the original uh, Burns collected verse. Uh, and surely you'll be your pint stout, and surely I'll be mine, and we'll tack. A cup of kindness yet for our Lang Syne. Uh, uh, and surely you'll be, be there is uh, buy. So surely you'll, you'll buy your pint of wine. Or uh, Burns was very fond of wine and port Malaga rather than beer or whiskey. Uh, and surely I'll be mine, but it really means I'll buy mine. So you buy your own drink and I'll buy mine. And we'll have we drink to each other's health. We'll not fall out about who buys it for our Lang Syne for the sake of the good old days. Then he gets nostalgic. We twa, we too have run about the braes uh, and pooed the gowns fine and pulled the daisies fine. But we've wandered money and a weary fit. Our feet have travelled far since Owl Lang Syne, since the days long since, since the good old times. We twa he paddled in the burden 
we we too have splashed in the the small stream. Of course, burn is the Scots word for a for a small stream or river. It's something that's very common here in Ulster. Uh, we we've paddled in the burn from morning sun till dying, from the from dawn to dusk essentially. Uh, but seas between us braid hey roared. Seas between us broad have roared since I lang syne since the good old days. And then you go into the last verse, and that's the point where you link hands together and start shaking. If you're at a proper Burns night supper, they're very particular about these things. And there's a hand, my trusty fear, and gies a hand of thine. There's a hand, my trusty friend, and gies a hand of thine, and give me your hand, and we'll tack a right, a right good wally wacht. A right good wally wacht sounds a bit strange to us, but it means we'll take a, a, a right good well drink, so a big slurp from our our pipe glass or our tankard for Auld Lang Syne for the good old days. So that brings us to the end of my little presentation. I hope you have learned something uh, from us tonight or today, whenever you're, you're coming into this. Burns is the most celebrated, iconic Scot probably of all time. Uh, he's popular uh, wherever people appreciate poetry and literature. literature. Um, he he was one of uh, the few Western authors, if you like, poets, um, artists uh, allowed during the, the communist regime in the school system. Uh, they had Burns's text. Why? Because his poetry espoused the rights of man about equality, about fraternity. Uh, and that was something that the, the Soviets thought could be shared. Uh, by this Scotsman who was born in 1859 and or 1759 and died in 1796. Why has Burns endured? Probably because he was a cult figure. He he expired before uh, his four score years uh, or three score years and ten or whatever it is. So you know he died age 37, very much in in the flush of youth. Uh, only whenever he was starting to gain notoriety and fame. Uh, and I suppose it's a question of what if, what if Burns had uh, survived into old age and dotage? What masterpieces could he have shared with Scots and with the world? Uh, at his funeral in the summer of 1796, um, there were over 10,000 people attended in Dumfries. Um, he was laid to rest in St Michael's churchyard. Uh, there was uh, a public collection taken up over the next uh, months and years and a, and a large Mausoleum, ma mausoleum was erected for his memory. There, um, there was a military band uh, accompanied the cortege at his funeral. Um, the person overseeing the the because of Bert Burns was a member of the the, the Dumfries Volunteers, the sort of local yeomanry militia uh, who had been gathered up to resist French uh, invasion in the time of the sort of uh, Napoleonic Wars, because so many of the standing army were away fighting uh, the. In, in America, uh, the time of the, the Wars of American Independence. Uh, so Burns belonged to this, this local uh, core of men, uh, was quite proud of it, wrote poems about it as well. He was a customs and excise man, so he was a, a civil servant. Um, he, he was an interesting character. He was a Scots patriot, but at the same time uh, was, was, was quite conservative at times in his poetry. He was a bit of a social chameleon, uh, looking through his letters, he seemed to change some of his opinions depending on who he was talking to. While always being a man of the people, he always sought to uh, to give pleasure and to keep on side uh, the people from the upper echelons of society, uh, landed aristocrats and people of status. Um, the day he was buried, his wife Jean Armour gave birth to uh, his youngest, his last roommate child who was Maxwell Burns. And uh, it's, it's just an absolutely fascinating character. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, the man who oversaw the, the military affairs in Dumfries the day of the funeral uh, later became Prime Minister, Lord Liverpool. Uh, so it, it's, Burns has, during his lifetime, he achieved a lot, achieved a lot of fame. Uh, classical people, as at Beethoven, uh, composed uh, melodies to accompany Robbie Burns's poems. Um, you know, he, he is a major global figure in the world of culture and literature, and it's only right that we remember that. Thank you.